Hi, everyone. You're listening to the Thought Row podcast. It's time to think creatively. I'm Rod Jones. And I'm Angie Jones. This podcast is all about inspiring creativity in your life. We will be sharing thought-provoking tips to help you be more creative every single day. Tune in each week for a new episode. We will be featuring some very talented and some interesting guests from all over the world. Our guests include creative people like artists, musicians, writers, performers, chefs, inventors, entrepreneurs, and many others. Yes, we want everyone to know these guests are not only creative, but they have insightful stories and information to share with you. Also, these talented people have such interesting lives and personal stories that are motivational and inspirational. When you tune into our weekly podcast, Inji will share with you an inspirational quote. I know you will find it to be motivating and a great way to start your day or keep you on track throughout the week. Yeah, just to let you guys know, the quotes that you hear on the show are available as screensavers for your phone or computer. It's available as a free download on our website at thoughtrow.com. Lots of inspiration to enjoy every day just for you all as a thank you gift from us for tuning into our podcast. Angie and I have been living the creative life for many years, and we want to share with you our tips, and our secrets of what we've learned along the way. That's right, Rod, and I think everyone will benefit from the stories and experiences we share. So, everyone, please remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. We would love for you to tune in. If you've been following our podcast, and I certainly hope you have been, you know that Angie starts out every podcast with a quote. So, here we go, Angie. What's the quote for today? You know, this this is probably one of my favorite quotes because I've heard it a million times, and I think everyone out there probably has too. And the quote is, we may lose, we may win, but we will never be here again. And Rod, you and I have heard that in the most funnest place that is when we're out yeah, having absolutely. adventures. Absolutely. Where, where is it from, though? I, I, it's from an album. and I, I it's, it's from the Eagles. You know, the, the yeah, rock yeah, group, yeah. the Eagles. Yeah. It's the song Take It Easy, and it was written by Jackson Brown and Glenn Fry. And um, the last I remember it is it was on their greatest hit album. I know it was probably on an earlier version, but that's the album that I remember. Well, every time I hear it, it reminds me of you and I running around the Southwest, most specifically uh, Arizona and a lot in New Mexico, um, but the times that we spent in Winslow, Arizona. And, you know, this song is all about Winslow, Arizona. In fact, there's even a statue there of... Right, of of someone standing on the corner in Winslow, Arizona. Yeah, they get... What's his name? Is it... I, you know, I don't know what the statue's name is, but, you know, oh, well, the you funny story. <laughs> no, the funny story about that is, I, you know, when I was looking up what album is this song on, um, they said that um, one of the... The two people that wrote it, either Jackson Brown or Glenn Fly, had broken down in that city. And that's where, you know, they, they decided to write the song about because they inserted where he had mechanical trouble with his car. Well, my favorite part is uh, a girl driving by in a flatbed Ford. Hope she takes a look at me. And then I guess that's where the line comes in. We may lose, we may win, but we'll never be back here again. And we didn't take that to heart. We went back to Winslow many a time, as well as other places that we explored uh, around the Southwest. Yeah, but you know, I think the the thing that I have a takeaway on this song lyric is that, you know, sometimes those moments, you just have to completely enjoy them and seize the moment, seize every moment that you can have. And, you know, whether it be creative or just, uh, you know, an everyday moment, sometimes just laughing and having a good time with your loved ones or being silly, I think that's where, you know, you you have this very precious memory. Yeah, well, we've been seizing the moment today. Um, (laughs) It's been snowing outside. It's beautiful, but it's cold. And then the other thing that has been happening is our power is uh, gone out and um, right. right when we were going to start our podcast, the power went out. And then, so well, we decided to wait 
and then the power came back on. It's been a little glitchy, but I don't think it's going to interfere with anything. Yeah, hopefully but not. we will post a we'll, we'll post a picture on our website of what it looks like outside, outside <laughs> yeah, outside the window of our sound studio, and then a general shot of what it looks like out our back from yeah. the direction of our uh, art studios. Yeah, this was supposed to be a little dusting, and it's turned into a lot more than that. So. Yeah, I'm guessing Surprise. we've got at least five inches, and uh, and right. it's still snowing. Yeah, it's still snowing. But it's beautiful. We just need to throw another log on the fireplace. <laughs> so talk about seizing the moment. Yes. Yeah, you know, creativity doesn't always come on time. I mean, we wish it did. The muse uh, floats in and floats out, and all of us have these periods where we go, oh, God, I got a brilliant idea, and I need to write it down, or they don't write it down, and it slips through their fingers, and then they never quite get back to it, and they go, oh, I wish I had that idea again. And, and this, we run, we all run that circle. Everybody runs that circle. We don't really know what to tell you is the best time to seize the moment. I guess the time to seize the moment is when you actually have a brilliant thought and you need to write it down. Or if you can, um, go to your piano, knock out some of the notes and write it down. Or if you're in the middle of writing something, make notes. Or if you're uh, a painter or a sculptor, uh, a dancer, you name it, whatever creative field you're in, when that muse does hit you, take notes. Absolutely. And, you know, I was reading, um, I think it was in Medium, actually, they were um, talking about how they were trying to do creativity when you have a full-time job. And sometimes that can be difficult because you are on a schedule, you're on someone else's schedule. And what if you are inspired, you know, in the middle of the day, and you don't want to forget what, you know, what you're doing, you try to make a note here and there and um, keep up with your creativity. But this one guy had a really great idea. And he did it on his lunch hour. Instead of socializing with everyone, this is, you know, in a workplace that is not obviously you know, staying at home and working or remotely. Con, or conducive. Yeah. But um, if you have a, um, a lunch hour, he would take 15 minutes of his lunch hour every day and he wrote a book on his cell phone. He used Scrivener and he wrote every day for 15 minutes. And he, he managed to bang out books like crazy. And he said it, he, was, he was so surprised that he could actually write a book under those, you know, like call to action kind of, I'm going to do my writing right now instead of doing it at home and, you know, having time to relax. He found that actually having a little bit of pressure helped him to be more creative because he had to call upon it right away and make it happen. I think that there's millions of creative people around the world who have a nine to five job. And, of course, they can be serving a cup of coffee to a customer or uh, or they're maybe uh, in a call center or maybe they're a service rep and they're uh, talking to a client. But all of a sudden, you know, thoughts and ideas come to us from, you know, we don't necessarily know where. But one of the things that can happen is when that idea does pop into your head, take the time to scribble down a note That's and so then important. build on it later. That's you you so know, important. you're not going to come like the song said, you uh, you may win, you may lose, but you're never going to be back there again. And you're not going to be back there where that thought is so preciously available in your mind. So by all means, make notes. Absolutely. And you know, when you make your note, make sure that you have a real place that you're keeping it and don't put it on one of those sticky notes and then you lose it or buy yourself a little notebook, buy yourself a, you know, a small notebook you can put in your purse or in your pocket where you can keep it and then put your note or Use your phone if you want to be a little bit more um, Yeah, I, I mean, I, as you know, I use Google Keep, and we used to keep our phones on our nightstand by our bed, and I kind of came to the conclusion that that isn't conducive to getting a good night's sleep. Even if you shut off the sound, uh, they just seem to light up all by their own in the middle of the night. So we keep them in another room. We can hear them if there's an emergency, if our daughter calls, whatever, we'll know it. Uh, mm -hmm. But it used to be where I would use Google Keep, and if I had a, a, a idea, a brilliant idea, in the middle of the night, I would sit there and pick up that phone and I would type it in. Now, I've also learned that sometimes in the middle of the night when you get a good idea, if it's worth keeping, it'll pop back into your head mm -hmm. in the morning. 
Right. And I don't know why it does. I mean, people say, oh, no, I lost such great idea in the middle of my dream, whatever. And yeah, it happens. I know it happens. This happened to me. But I personally use Google Keep. It seems to do the job for me. But there's other programs out there that you can get on your phone. But the safest thing is to have a little notebook uh, and then you can take what you write in your notebook and then you can move it to whatever document that you need. If you're a writer and you want to, like Angie mentioned earlier, Scribner or a Microsoft program or whatever or you use. Google Docs. What Go- is it? Google Docs is also Oh, yeah, Google good. Docs. That's what I use. Yeah, because it's free. <laughs> 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 you don't have to pay for it. But, you know, okay, so either a notebook or if you have an app on your phone, uh, like on an Apple phone, there's a notes section. You can put that on your notes on there so that way you have it with you. Or there's Google Keep, Google Docs. Of course, there's Word. Um, and Scrivener for writers is really important because you can plot out characters. You can plot out all kinds of things in there and really have it in a cohesive place. But with Scrivener, as I'm coming to find out, because I'm still kind of learning that myself, because that's new for me, always have a backup, backup to Dropbox or Drive or something else so you don't lose all of your work, which has been a complaint with some Scrivener um, users. And also Evernote. Um, I know there's a few others, but those are the major ones that we have been experienced with, and they're very good for uh, putting down your notes and your thoughts and keeping them cohesive. Yeah, one of the things I want to mention, because it happens to all of us, happens to me, happens to NG, is not every idea you have is going to be brilliant. Um, We like to think they're brilliant, but they're not. And you may write down an idea, and you may come back and look at it a week later or whatever, and you go, wow, what was I thinking? That I, I have nowhere to go with that idea. And it seems so brilliant or so wonderful at the time. Don't be too judgmental of yourself in that area. Not every idea is a great idea. Some shine better than others. And interestingly enough, I've had an idea, written it down, didn't look at it for a week, went back to it and thought, eh, you know, I don't know that I can really do anything with this, especially when it comes to painting, you know, a color combination or a design, something along those lines. And then I forget about it for a while. Then maybe a week, a month, some cases I've gone as long as a year, have gone back to that idea because now I approach it with a fresher mind, fresher thinking. And then all of a sudden I'm able to work it. And it turns out to be something more than I even thought it could possibly be. Have you had that experience? So true. In fact, this morning I was a little frustrated because I was trying to write a caption for a post that I was making on Instagram and Facebook. And it was like nothing was happening. I was a complete blank. And through our conversation, Rod was really instrumental in helping me to loosen things in my head because sometimes you get so like, you know, I got to make this post. I got to do this. And, and your mind is maybe somewhere else and you, you don't, you can't make it happen. And he said something very interesting to me. He goes, just because you go to door A and you're getting nothing, why are you not going to door B, C, D, or E in your mind And trying different avenues, don't get so frustrated that you're only trying the same door over and over, try a different door. And it was like, yeah, I mean, how simple is that? But there's many times when I know this is just not for myself, but you know, many of you out there where you get frustrated and you keep kind of beating your head against the same door, the same wall, when there's many windows and doors and other rooms. And why are you not going there? I said that. (laughs) You said that this morning. Good for you. (laughs) Well, maybe I should apply that to myself more than, you know, telling other people. You know, I thought that was so insightful, and I really needed to hear that. Thank you. The one thing that seems to work for me, and it's not difficult, actually, to tune into it, and that is just let your ideas and thoughts flow through you. Don't be judgmental, don't have preconceived notions, and certainly don't put pressure on yourself. You could put pressure on yourself if you're trying to make a post or you're trying to finish a paragraph and make it sound really good in, in something you're writing, a book, or a, even as simple as a business letter. You know, maybe you're trying to make something sound a bit more succinct so people uh, it's clear or people understand it. And then you start putting pressure on yourself. It seems to me 
the biggest mistake we all make, I make it, everybody makes it, is we put too much pressure on ourselves, thinking that we need perfection. Perfection doesn't exist. It never has. But when you let ideas and thoughts kind of flow through you, you don't, you're not judgmental. You're not saying, oh, that's good, that's bad, or this may work or this may not work. You just kind of go with the flow. I know that's an old, tired, tired statement, but going with the flow when it comes to creativity is uh, really important. It is important because otherwise you get yourself so anxiety or tensed up to where it just everything goes blank and then you have nothing like crickets literally and that's when it gets even more frustrating because you're like hold it but I know I have this talent because I've done this before but yet all of a sudden I have nothing I have crickets I have it's dry but it's stepping away if you feel that way and going, okay, so let's think about something else. Let's think about my next project or let's think about some other ideas that I have. And then pretty soon you can loosen that caged up thinking that you're doing for yourself to where creativity can evolve and can come out of your brain and of your soul. Yeah, there's been many times when you read people's autobiographies and people say, how did you come up with that brilliant idea, that invention, or you came up with just the absolute perfect notes for a composition? And invariably, people will say, well, you know, it popped into my head when I was driving my car. I wasn't even thinking about it. I was thinking about something else. Actually, you should be paying attention to the road. But, you know, people, our <laughs> minds do drift. The other thing is they'll say, oh, well, I was uh, baking a cake. I was fixing dinner. I was washing the dishes. I was, you know, I was vacuuming. And then all of a sudden, this idea came to me out of nowhere. Those are the kinds of things we suggest that you write down. They can be very fleeting, but they're, you know, they're a gift from the universe. By all means, attach yourself to them and make something happen out of them. Every single human being has this happen. In fact, if that has happened to you, make sure you um, email us. And, uh, you know, we'll read some of the ones yeah, we'll that read your, make um, comments ahead. and things that you have or your tips or your frustrations, because this is a, a community of creatives. And if you have some little trick or hint or what works for you, it might be helpful for someone that's trying to evolve their creativity process. Yeah, we would love to take advantage of your tricks. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, I don't know about take advantage, but I think it could be really helpful for people and it makes you feel good when you can help others as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Sharing with others things that you've learned along the way. I mean, you think about artists, which is a little closer to maybe my thinking. Uh, some of the greatest artists have been some of the greatest teachers and they were more than happy to share what they've learned. Uh, composers, some of the greatest composers were teachers. Beethoven was a teacher. He taught students. That's correct. Now, you know, he taught students because it was a way of making an income. But he actually, at least from what I've read, he thoroughly enjoyed sharing with other people the knowledge that he's learned composing and even playing the piano. I mean, he had piano students. I don't know any great composer that has not been a teacher. And I think that's true with artists, although artists have a tendency to try to covet all their Sometimes. brilliant ideas. I don't know. Thomas Hart Benton was certainly very mentoring to Jackson Pollock. So, you know, I think that there is that mentality. If you're really comfortable in your own space as an artist, I think then you can be giving. If you're a little insecure and maybe too competitive, then it turns into, oh, I'm not going to share it, which is not really good for the creative process because then it makes you bottled up. You're not letting that creativity flow. Well, that, that was a really good example because if anybody is familiar with Thomas Hart Benton's art and Jackson Pollock's art, Very uh, different. there's, there, there's Very different. no comparison. Um, one's a regionalist, uh, Thomas Hart Benton, and they, he painted his paintings. You could tell stories. It was pretty clear what was going on. Uh, Jackson Pollock was uh, abstract, abstract depressionism, I guess you would call it. And it's really out there. And he left all the thinking up to you. You have to be the one who comes up with what right. you see, what you feel and all that. But Pollock uh, often in in uh, books that I've read about his thoughts about creativity, he 
on many occasions refer to the things that he learned from Thomas Hart Benton. Right. And I think having sometimes having a, a, a buddy, and you're both trying to paint, you're both trying to write poetry, or you're both trying to practice the art of dance. It's really helpful if you can share those ideas with someone else and you, know, you create a cadre and everybody comes up with a different idea. That's why they often say creative teams come up with brilliant ideas because one thought uh, generates another thought from another person. This person says that. The other person goes, oh, wow, what if we did this? What if we did that? Everybody gets really, really excited and Great stuff percolates out of all that effort. Right on. It's kind of like when you go swimming, and they always gave you a swimming buddy so you wouldn't get into trouble, and you would not get panicky if something happened because you knew someone else was going to be there. And maybe creativity is kind of like that. If you have your swim buddy... You're gonna be, you're gonna feel more comfortable, not put so much pressure on yourself, and you have someone to bounce ideas off of. You know, you have to, of course, find that right buddy for you that fits with your personality and your style of um, thinking and so forth. But it's really, I think, valuable for someone not to be always in your head because a lot of the times when you're doing something artistic or creative, you're pretty much in your head the whole time. So if you have no companion, you have no um, person to bounce your ideas off of, it's very difficult to know if it's good, bad, and different. Although there is no such thing as Rod has told me there's no such thing as a a bad painting or a bad you know whatever you've written it's more of an evolution this may not be exactly what you want right this moment but in the future in a couple of days you may evolve it into something else that's meaningful or more satisfying to your creativity and in your in your soul and in your mind so you know sometimes having that extra person as your foil is so important. I think you really summed it up quite well. And this probably all leads to something you and I were talking about over the last couple of days. It seems to impact us a lot. I know it impacts virtually everybody. There's a lot of anxiety and stress in this world right now. And it gets down to finding time to create. Right. And also don't let the stresses of the world take precedence over your thoughts. It's really hard to do that, especially all the time. But there are times when you can channel yourself and just stay directed and stay focused on what it is that you want to do and how you're doing it and the steps you're taking and getting involved in the process instead of just the outcome. And then you'll find yourself not being so addicted to um, the outcome only, which you you see that a lot on social media again. I say again, because, you know, every time you turn on social media, there's some dude on there talking about how he's so like super successful and he's got all these cars and yachts and everything. And it's like, but really, I I think the process is more fun than even the outcome. And the outcome is very cool if you're successful, but success is all relative. If you feel good about what you're doing and you feel satisfied, then you're definitely going to be happy instead of just waiting for when, when am I going to make my millions? When am I going to become a bestseller? When am I going to, you know, when I'm, my painting's going to sell for millions, be more cognizant of where you're at right this moment. Yeah, that's that whole thing that I'll be happy when I graduate from high school. I'll be happy when I graduate from college. I'll be happy when I get married. I'll be happy when I'm a child. You know what's funny, though, about that, Rod, is once someone graduates from high school and then graduates from college and then hopes to get married, then they start looking back on, oh, remember what we did in high school? (laughs) Oh, remember all the cool stuff we did in college? And, oh, remember when we were dating? It's like we're always reminiscing instead of looking at our current situation, looking at how we're living our lives every single day and not being distracted and trying to really treat our moments very preciously because like the quote said, we will never be here again. That moment is never going to come back. Is it going to get better or change? Yeah, of course it is. 
But that particular moment is never going to come back. So now that moment's never going to come back. You should thoroughly enjoy it. And you're going to reminisce, but you also can't look so far forward that you determine that your happiness or you're going to be a lot happier if this happens or if that happens. You know, if I get married, I'll be happy. Right. Uh, if I have a child, I'll be happy. Right. After you have children, probably the next thing you think about is, boy, I can't wait till they grow up. Um, <laughs> they move <you> know, out. <laughs> yeah, they move out. So every segment or every part of your life happens. And, uh, and all along the way, you need to try to find or come up with strategies to find that precious time to create. Right, exactly. And and enjoy your creative process. Don't rush it by going, oh, I can't wait to get this painting done and it's going to either sell or I'm going to put it on social media or you somebody's know, I just, gonna like or somebody's going to like it. Or somebody's going to like it. I'm going to get 100 likes how in about, one hour. How about if you like it? And it really doesn't matter how many people like it on social media, if you're going to sell it or not. Yeah, the dollars would be really good. I'm sure everyone can use a little extra cash these days. But really, concentrate on why you like it. Why do you like doing it? Why do you like these colors you use? Why do you like these lines you've put? Or what mediums did you use? Like kind of relish in the process instead of, you know, the outcome. Well, the outcome is a a result of the effort that you put into it. And I always like to say, you've heard me say it a million times, the only person that I ever try to compete with is myself. I don't try to judge myself or my work against other people's work. And I know people that are very talented in so many different disciplines. I mean, people that are even very talented in building a business or making the perfect apple pie or the most excellent pizza. They're very creative and very talented, and they don't judge their creations against other people's creations. I wish that was more common. I don't think it's as common as it probably should be. Everybody wants to, you know, win the blue ribbon. Everybody wants to compete against everybody else, uh, you know, best of show. Uh, That's why they come up with these competitions. But sometimes I think these competitions are just a way for the people that put up these competitions to make money. Mm -hmm, You you know, the only person that's really going to judge how you feel about what you've created or how you think about what you created should be yourself. If you go to bed at night and you go, wow, I just had such a great time uh, doing that painting or writing that uh, poem or writing Mm -hmm. uh, the book I was working on. Those are precious moments that you should celebrate. Celebrate with yourself. It's okay to say to yourself, wow, I did a really good job there. I'm so pleased that I had the talent or the talent was given to me somewhere along the line. And the other people that have come into my life that have encouraged me and how important they were, you know, like your parents or a sibling or a good friend who comes and pats you on the back and says, wow, you know, I really, really love that painting. And you should be happy that people say that. But the first person you really want to please is yourself. And don't be afraid to pat yourself on the back. Don't be afraid to say, hey, you know what? I'm really good at this. You don't need to, you know, go out and brag or let it inflate your ego. Just do it, you know, to that little still voice inside. It'll make you feel better, make you sleep better, and make you happier and more pleasant to be around. Right. And just work on your happiness instead of being quick to show what you're doing. You know, you be the happy person about your artwork, your creativity, or your writing. So the whole idea now was for us to talk about finding the time to create. And so we're going to share with you strategies that have worked for us. I'm going to put this back on Angie. (laughs) Uh, How about you name one strategy of how you find time to create, and then I will try to do the same. Well, I'm going to do a little bit of a, what do you call that, where you admit something that you totally do all the time yourself. I guess that's what it is. Is the word procrastinate? Yeah, it includes that word, a lot of that. Um, Because I personally can speak from my own, uh, I guess, bad habit. I will procrastinate because... It makes me stressed out. I can't, like, I get choked up and I can't create or I get so anxiety that, like, I just don't want to deal with anxiety, so just don't do it. I'd rather go clean or make some food or do something that's pleasurable so I don't, I'm not putting myself under stress. So I think the first thing is, is don't procrastinate because really 99.9% of the time, if you just jump in and do it, whether it's right, wrong, or in between, It doesn't matter because you've just started. 
And that makes it so much easier. And I know sometimes, especially when I go to write, it will seem really tough to get in the office and go on my wonderful computer and type. And it's like, I I just can't do this today. But once I start, it just starts happening. And I think that's true for everyone. Once you just start, it just starts evolving. There's an old Turkish saying about how if you're knitting something and then you see a string and you pull it and then the thread you know, it unravels very quickly. It's kind of the same thing. Once you find that little tiny piece of string that you are going to go and pull at and pick at, it starts to unravel everything. And that's really what happens with your creativity. It just starts to flow. You'll start to unravel all sorts of things. So just jump in and do it. Don't procrastinate. The other thing to me is starting that old saying about a journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. A lot of writers do their best to come up with that first opening line, not the title of a book or or the piece that they're working on, but that opening line, because that opening line sets the stage for a whole bunch of other lines that are going to fall in place. I think that people that compose music, you know, they need those opening notes. There's been some really famous Uh, notes like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, those simple notes that he came up with that turned out to be so incredibly complex because he was able to build a major composition behind it. Start with just coming up with a simple sentence, a simple idea. When you're facing a blank canvas and there's no color on it whatsoever, uh, a lot of times people say just scribble something on it because that scribbling will give you an idea or you'll connect one line to another line or all of a sudden you come up with a composition that you didn't know that you had within you. Starting is probably the hardest. I know when I sit down to write, I can give myself all kinds of reasons why I don't want to, but then I came up with a little trick. I go, well, I'm not going to go write. All I'm going to do is just come up with that opening line, and then I'm going to go do something else. Well, invariably, once I write that opening line, it triggers additional thinking. I I read a long time ago where this guy hated to run, but he knew he needed the exercise. So he would tell himself when he would get up in the morning, it would be cold outside. He would go, I'm not going to run today. All I'm going to do is wash my face, and I'm going to put on my running clothes, but I'm not going outside And then he thought, well, I better put on my running shoes. And then he goes, well, maybe I'll just go to the front door and see what the weather's like outside. (laughs) Well, it's Uh not so bad outside, so I'll just walk outside and look around for a while, look at the trees or whatever. And then he thought, well, you know, it ain't going to hurt me. Here I am. I'm all dressed, ready to go. Maybe I'll just, just walk to the, I'll run. No, actually, I'll walk. I'll just walk to the corner. Well, if I'm walking, maybe I'll just start jogging a little bit. Before you know it, he's jogged, you know, two miles, whatever his distance that he decides is best for him. But a lot of times it's that simple. Just make one simple thing. If you're going to bake a cake, you don't have to bake the cake. Just bring out the flour in the pan. Right. Let it sit there in front of you for a while. Well, ready. if you got that far, what are you going to do next? Well, you, well cake's good. You want some damn cake. Right. Yeah, think about <laughs> think about the enjoyment that it's going to bring you, your family, what's going to go best with it. You know, is it a dessert or is it an afternoon snack with your uh, tea like we often have? Right. I have another uh, hint, actually. And, oh, that's, and it's another one that I think it's super easy for everyone to do. And that is taking a baby step. Take baby steps and don't jump into like, oh, I need to do like 50 things to make this happen. Just take one step or take two steps during the day. And, you know, and they add up over the week instead of jumping in and being, oh, my gosh, I need to do all of these things all this week. And here's my list of things to do. Well, really, you only need to do one thing, one thing for that day. And then if you have time or you feel like it, then you can go on to your second thing or a third thing. And pretty soon you've done four or five things that really add up because each day you're, you end up doing four or five things because you've conned yourself into thinking that this was not so hard because you've taken tiny baby steps instead of looking at your to-do list and being so overwhelmed. And then another hint that I have, uh, this is regarding painting, is that I have 
a particular painting that I use as my warm-up painting. And it was a project that didn't turn out so good. So now I just use that painting as a warm-up painting. Like, I'll put it on my easel. It's got a bunch of stuff on it. So I'm not looking at a blank canvas. I'll throw some color on it, or I'll try a weird technique on it. It just it starts your creative juices flowing and your mental juices flowing. So it's kind of like my muse painting. Oh, good idea. Yeah, that way you, you go in, you can just start right away. Way. You don't have to sit around and think about it or feel, you know, nervous that, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do or I don't want to, you know, mess up my canvas with the wrong color. Really, there's no such thing because you can always cover it up. But try doing a muse painting where if it's something that didn't turn out so good, you can go in and put a few strokes on it, scribble on it. You can do whatever. And it really doesn't count for anything other than warming you up. Just like an athlete would warm up. You have to warm up your hands. You have to warm up your brain your eyes, your soul, everything. And I think it's a great idea for everyone to go in and start out that way. Creativity is supposed to be fun. And in the beginning, it it really is. Then all of a sudden, we have a nasty habit of putting pressure on ourselves. (laughs) Yes. And then once that pressure starts happening, or you want to compete with others, or you say to yourself, oh, it's not as good as it could be or should have been, or I made a mistake, or I did this, or I did that. Once you start that judgmental game of yourself, the fun of creativity seems to end abruptly. You can't allow, in my opinion, you can't allow yourself to get into that situation. If you ever see a child, when you hand them a box of crayons, they innocently can play for hours with a box of crayons. And they're just, you know, some drawings, you can actually understand what they are thinking and what they're drawing. This is all just free flowing through their mind. And my favorite thing, which I actually had the opportunity to witness, I was at my sister's house. And there's a wall between them and the neighbor. And on the other side of the wall, I heard this dog running around. He was running in the yard. I heard this. He was doing something. He was like, he was panting, but you could tell he was happy. So I kind of peered over the wall and I watched this dog for a while. He was playing with a ball. There was no other dogs around. The people that lived in that home were not there. This dog all of a sudden decided to have a great time and he was having the best time with himself and nobody was throwing the ball for him. He didn't need, he didn't need another dog saying, oh wow, you sure know how to play with that (laughs) ball or you throw that ball. He was even pitching it up into the air himself and catching it and then he would roll it, then he would chase it. Then as dogs love to do, he'd get down, lay on his stomach and he would push that ball around on his side and put it in his mouth and push it around some more with his paws. To me, you know, we've all seen dogs have a lot of fun and cats and other animals, but but to me, here the here with this dog having absolute joy and fun playing. And he didn't care who saw him. He didn't need another dog's approval. He didn't need anybody's approval. In fact, had I not seen him, nobody probably would have ever known what a great time right. this pup had. Oh, that's just so sweet. But again, he was just living in the moment and really enjoying what was going on with him. He made it happen. Yeah, and finding time to create may just turn out to be as simple as living in that moment. Now, you may need to schedule that moment or you may need to find that moment, but that in itself can create stresses that you don't want. If you sit there and say, oh, I have to have this done by a certain date. Well, that in one respect isn't such a bad thing. I mean, I myself do a post every Wednesday of a new painting. That means I need to write something and I need to create a painting every single week. By doing that or by setting up that schedule, at first I felt pressure. Now I actually really enjoy it because I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to crank out uh, or create one beautiful painting. Uh, Sometimes they're beautiful. And I'm going to do that every single week. And then I'm going to write a story about it. And it gives me... So you made it a routine. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's a routine. So there's a lot of comfort in that. It's less stressful that way. Yeah, so maybe finding the time to create gets down to you creating your own routine. Maybe you're particularly good in the morning. Maybe you're particularly good in the evening. You know, maybe you're particularly good at the lunch hour that you have, and you can do a little bit of creating there. 
I'm going to, we're going to have a guest uh, coming up, not today, but in the near future, who is a writer. And what is most fascinating about this guy is he has written 13 books. He's a bestseller on Amazon. And he wrote all of these books by dictating it into a recorder, driving to and from work, which he had about a drive time of, I think he said, 40 minutes maybe less. And then he would hand that recording to his wife. So while he was at work, driving to work the next day, recording more, his wife would transcribe it. So when he would get back that night, he could see what he had written, which triggered additional thoughts. Or he said, oh, you know, I really should flush this out or I should write this out. So the very next morning when he went back to work, he was driving with his little recorder, safely, of course. He was recording what his uh, next thoughts and ideas or a chapter, whatever was going to go in that book. And 13 published books. That's a lot is, of books. Yeah, That's I was going to say, books. you know, there was a lot of driving going on. Uh, you know, and he obviously on weekends, he filled in things and polished it. But I thought, talk about inspirational. And here's a guy who had a nine to five job. Actually, he put in more hours than that. Uh, I remember him telling me more often than not, he didn't leave work until like eight o'clock at night. Right. I know he has long days. And I love that he took the time that he was, you know, commuting to dictate this book, get it done. And he's done it 13 times. That's a lot of writing. Well, I hope you got, I hope you benefited from some of the things that Inji and I shared with you. This is kind of a labor of love. Yeah, We've had a us, lot of yes. experiences. We've learned a lot. We're really excited about the guests that we have lined up. These are people that know what they're talking about. They're going to share some really wonderful thoughts and ideas for you. But I think at this point, we're going to wrap this up. You have a closing thought? Um, just that don't put pressure on yourself. If you make it a routine, it will probably be less uh, uncomfortable. And just remember to stay in the moment, stay in the day. I'm really glad you tuned in today. We hope you enjoyed the thoughts and ideas we shared with you. We post a new podcast every week, so remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. So it's bye for now from my husband Rod and I, wishing everyone a great day. Mm-hmm.